Good, sir. Well, good morning. So it's good, good to be here among friends as well as seeing new talent in, uh, in research and, and sort of industrial applications. Well, so today I decided to talk about smart systems. I think, but because of the uniqueness of the region here, I'll focus on uh, manufacturing. So basically, I'll try to present the vision of, of smart, smart manufacturing. And uh, the data vision will be tinted uh, with, with this big data. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about key characteristics that are emerging in, in smart systems, including resilience, sustainability, as well as maybe uh, democratization of manufacturing. So, obviously, we all witness uh, emerging applications of, of smart systems almost in any domain. So, we talk about smart grid, smart transportation, autonomous transportation, well, healthcare is, is definitely undergoing transportation, precision agriculture also, water, even we don't see probably, but there's many wastewater processing plants, you know, that are really, really that, you know, underground, and also, they also undergo transformation, automation, and, 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 and applications of smart, smart solutions. And manufacturing, as well as even workforce, also undergo transformation. So, first of all, we, we, we think that, you know, data it, is going to play sort of increasingly growing role in manufacturing in, and other applications. So, so the question arises is, you know, what is big data and who has big data? So if I had a score sheet of sort of data availability, so manufacturing would not come very high on the list because, you know, in order to, to, to term uh, industry as possessing large volumes of data, well, you, you, could, you could use analogy of a spreadsheet. You know, that spreadsheet should have, you know, large number of, of columns as well as large number of rows. You know, so to get such spreadsheet with good quality data in manufacturing would be, would be a challenge. So certainly, manufacturing has large volumes of data and the only, thing, the only question is, you know, how useful this data is and in, in essence, is it's big data. So I think the general answer would be that we are heading towards dealing with big data, with large volumes of data in manufacturing, but I think we are mostly not there. There will be exceptions, you know, maybe semiconductor industry versus, you know, machine shop. Obviously, there will be a different um, list in terms of big data. So some kind of a semi-formal definition of big data is that we look at volume of data, velocity and veracity. So there is, you know, we have this V alphabet that we use for uh, describing big data. So we say that if, if application meets two of those Vs, well, then the data is big. So application that will have large volumes of data and maybe data will be streamed at high frequencies. So they're meeting those two criteria will, will, will say that such domain is big data domain. So I think that the problem with manufacturing, you know, being in this big data school is that for years we have promoted lean manufacturing. And at the same time, we did not have really technology to make use of, of data, and therefore, uh, there, 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 we, we, we have been delayed in, 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 in taking full advantage of, of the so data analytics and, and development of, of large-scale smart systems. So basically, how do we model from data? Because you know, most of us were educated in traditional science. So in traditional science, you know, we, 
When we see a problem, then basically we look you know, to our background and depending on our training, well, we'll pick one of the models that we feel comfortable with and basically apply this model. Obviously, we'll be doing some tweaking, we'll be, we'll be doing modifications to the model, so someone who works optimization will, will change maybe objective function, will change a constraint. So, so tr traditionally, in modeling, we attempt to fit in a construct, a model that, that we feel comfortable with. So this is, in a way, similar to what maybe statisticians will do. Now, data-driven modeling is, works in the opposite direction. It's actually bottom-up versus you know, top-down approach. So we look at data, we scan data as much as we have, and basically, based on the, 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 the data, we, we develop a model, and, and by the way, a model is developed autonomously because we'll be using learning algorithms that basically design the model. In traditional approaches, we, we fit the model and, and, and we actually determine what the model is, what, what variables it includes and all, what objective function it has. Well, for us, now in, in data-driven approach, a model is built. So, so typical step in, in developing um, applications of smart systems will be that you know you look you look at problem or a problem, then you have to see whether there is there is enough data that will support actual research in that area, and then you make well go no go decision. If there is no enough data, so so that you have to go, probably go back. You can launch a, a, a study, get more data. If you have, then you 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 you, pers you just continue, and and then you do have to do some data assessment because again, in many applications, <coughs> and if I had time, I could just talk here. There, there are plenty of data. However, the data is of so low quality or or sparse or just basically irrelevant also. So then you cannot do much with it. And then if the data, if you have support, sufficient support by the data, then you, you develop a model and then basically, and as well as deploy the model. So that's, that would be a natural process that we, we, we go through. It's, it's time consuming, it's, it's expensive, but, but essentially <coughs> this, this, this is again, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a different process from classical modeling because it's a bottom up process. And, and, and algorithms are developing models for us. And again, another also feature of, of data-driven modeling is that we are not confined to a given number of parameters. If you look in all classical theories, so you know, physics or, or, or biology, there's usually variables that are predetermined. So if you take transportation model, for example, well, you know, the, 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 the variables have been de basically are determined. And, and, you know, so you may, you may modify it, you may introduce additional variable, but, but I think, but you can, but you still stay within relatively narrow domain. In, in data-driven modeling, you can actually fuse different domains. So it, there's nothing that prevents me from taking data, maybe material data, then, then also operational data maybe, as well as, 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 you know, supply chain data and fusing them and, and, and developing a model. You know, so, so, so that's the reason why, you know, we have done almost, um, you know, sort of unprecedented progress in some areas, but by fusing data from different domains, uh, which, which with classical sciences we have basically difficulties. So, so if you have the right support for the data, that you essentially develop, as I call it, digital replica. I think industry likes to call it digital twin, but you know, but the problem with using digital twin is that you know, digital twin suggests that you know, when you have a physical system, you develop digital twin, but that's only one twin. Well, you know, I have spent over 20 years working in data science, so I, I seldom see one twin. I see many twins, you know, so the four, in, as, in essence, what, what we develop, we, we, you know, we develop digital replicas of phenomena of interest. 
and well, and, and try to integrate perhaps them into just just one model. But in general, there will be different models. So, so I think that maybe using the term twin is, is is probably not very very fortunate, basically. And because models are again high fidelity, so that that therefore they they deserve you know to this 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 you know uh, basically right term such as replica or 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 twin. So, so in essence, uh, in typical applications of of data science, we, we use data and we just the data is processed by different algorithms. For example, machine, you know, machine learning is one of the preferred tools that we use. Um, and, and then we, we basically have to apply, we have to use those algorithms somewhere. So often we, 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 we deploy them as, as control algorithms or as, as decision making algorithms, as predictive algorithms. You know, and so, so by, by solving models, we deliver solution. And since models are non-differentiable, so, so therefore we, we, we are not able to use gradient-based classical optimization. Rather, we use evolution computation. So I will say that, you know, the, if I was to split sort of weight between the two, between the modeling part and solution part, so it would be sort of 50-50. And, and, and I see that, you know, in many, especially in the research community, once we go through the machine learning, we think, well, we are done. I would say, no, you are just about half done. That, that 50%, you need to continue. You need to solve the model as well as, 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 as deploy the model. So, and also now in general and also here. So I would like to present a word of caution because very often we... Uh, you see, we, we, we get presented with a problem, or we select the problem, and quickly rush to solving it. And I had plenty of examples that, you know, that uh, I would have industries coming to me and saying, well, look, here uh, we have a problem. We have actually a machine learning problem. This is our data, so go ahead and, and, and develop this model for, for you. I say, I look at the data, I say, you know what, basically, uh, you, you, you need to use simulation here. You cannot use machine learning. You know, so I'm talking, you know, to, instead of attracting people to me, so I'm talking them out of it because, well, because basically the, the data that exists does not, you know, fit the problem they would like to formulate and solve. So, so in many cases, basically, uh, you know, it's better not to solve problem or just... Or, or just basically modify the problem or simply modify the scope in a way that we need to be more careful, especially when it comes to data science research, more careful in, in formulating the problem because um, it's, it's eerie. such formulation requires usually multi-domain perspective and, and most of the time we do with, deal with one or two, two, two people, one or two experts, and they may actually do not see the overall picture and since also maybe lack of familiarity sometimes with, uh, with, the, well, with data science, so will prevent them from you know, formulating that problem the right way. So if I have time, I could, I could explore more on this. <clears throat> also, what I like is this actually slide that I'm borrowing from World Economic Forum. You know that because as researchers, we like to always basically focus here. So basically we say <coughs> that progress will be made and, and we, we don't consider any other <coughs> external event. But you know, even with this, with AI, so with artificial intelligence, well, there could be something going wrong, maybe going too far, you know, when we, we develop those, those autonomous, you know, fighting machines that will be fighting us instead of maybe just working the way we, 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 we intend. So something could happen here wrong. So we have to, we have to, we have to watch and I'll, 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 I'll just continue later. Then also might be that, you know, there might be unusual living climate change, you know, disasters. So, so we have to be aware that, you know, there could be those major disruptors, including also basically politics as well. So they could, this could affect large regions of, of, of the world. And we, we ought to be sometimes also considering those facts in, in, in modeling. So we know that, that progress is enabled by this alphabet, you know, from, we start from A with automation, big data, 
and, and, and you know, through digitization and so on. So I'll focus on key technologies of smart manufacturing. Well, the reason that I'm listing them here, because you know, some of them will be actually generating data, some of them will be processing data, some of them will be also developing maybe models and solutions. So obviously, you know, automation technology makes progress by itself. And, you know, the, the systems, the, the equipment that we sort of develop today is smarter than used to be in the past. And we obviously will incorporate with other components. So, so data storage is, is you know, is, is, is also an important part here, as well as digitization technology, because in the era of digital manufacturing, well, we, we, we also need to consider, we need to consider this technology in this overall picture of smart manufacturing. And, you know, as, 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 as we hear, uh, well, cloud computing will be one of the main drivers. So, so basically, all these data and logistics assets will be moving to the cloud. And then we need to process, you see, process, launch, uh, you know, various, various algorithms, various procedures. So agent technology could be example technology that could basically perform such tasks. Well, maybe one of those agents will be very specific agent is prediction agent. So, so you know, prediction is this, this so one dimension that, that sort of differentiates very significantly maybe manufacturing of the past to the manufacturing of the future. You, if you, you, you look back at the literature or, or your applications, so many previous studies were static. We just did not, we are not able to consider time variable, except maybe simulations, you know, which sort of were quite actually narrow, narrow uh, take path in, in various applications. So, so there was a, now, you see, predicting technology allows to incorporate time. So we can actually develop the models. We can see the future. And I think that's a very valuable addition to smart manufacturing. Now I'll just focus on actually three areas, three domains, because you know, they are maybe have received little less attention than the others in manufacturing. The first one is resiliency. Sustainability and, and, and I'll touch on democratization in manufacturing. So, so what is happening is that, uh, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of literature on resiliency, but if you look into details, into small print, then most of it focuses actually on reliability. You know, it's a very, you know, and, and if, you know, just, you know, actually probably definitions are not very practical, rather just, you know, we, we just introduce very quickly probability of some events and, and, and continue. But I think resiliency is this. See? Resiliency has this multitude of dimensions and variables that we have never looked at, okay? So, so you know, if you are not productive, over time, you know, facility may you not know, survive. So that's also, it's, it's, it's a dimension of uh, resiliency. When workforce is not prepared to work, to deal with new technology, that's also contributes to resiliency. Transport, you know, supply chain, logistics, you know, so, and including sustainability. So energy, obviously, if you don't have energy, then you cannot operate anything. I mean, they, we, 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 we cannot exist. Actually, if you look at commodities, you see, if you look at commodities, so energy is as a top commodity, the most important commodity. Because if we don't have energy, there's no manufacturing, there's no service, there's no transportation, there's no food distribution, essentially. So... So you see, all of those attributes, and, and could be some, could be, there could be more, are important. Now, each could be measured with some variables. So, so what I would suggest that, you know, we need to develop some type of resiliency index. You know, that each manufacturing would have some resiliency index. And ideally, we would like to collect all data for this resiliency index, uh, basically, so autonomously. We wouldn't like to do, have any uh, manual, kind of basically, data uh, collection. So, so that's a very important. Now, you know, sustainability. So uh, I spend a little, quite a bit of you know, time in Asia, and I see the, you know, the, the, the industry struggling with the environmental issues, you know, and society also. I mean, being not the most um, 
happy because of the of this development. So, so I think something has to be done. And so basically, if you look in the past, I think so we have been littering, you know, the earth and the air as well as waters. And there is this, you know, problem of plastic bottle that that we should be ashamed of. That you know that that's you know the plastic gets accumulated, eaten by fish, and then microplastic being everywhere, and the problem has not been solved. You know we we solve we have solved so many different problems, but we cannot solve just plastic bottle problem. Okay, and this is not going to go away, so we have to solve it. So in order to do so, we need to transform sustainability into business, viable business, just for profit business. Essentially, and I think there's a way. If we apply our ingenuity to it, we can do it. So, so uh, th this is my sabbatical semester. So I suggested this idea to, to well, the group I was working with, with one of the Asian countries. They say, oh, well, you know what? It's a good idea, but the central government it was probably wouldn't support it. Okay. So then I, I wrote a small piece and submitted to Nature, and I think Nature said that's a good idea. So maybe, hopefully, that you know. And I have, I have worked out some details, so this is not something that, that sort of wouldn't work. You know, because in many parts of the world, there's maybe one job and four people doing it. Okay, so, so the other three people are redundant. So productivity varies like across scale. So, so we can take advantage of this. The people doing nothing, well, if we deploy them to clean the environment, well, they can do it. And, and obviously, if you if you clean environment, then then people will be very happy to come to pay for it, you know. So so there is so there is room for different business models, and and I think this this needs 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 to happen. And this this applies to air, surface, you know, groundwater, as and, and and soil. But I think it needs actually serious attention, business attention. So obviously, we'll be moving. You know, we are moving very slowly from linear economy. To, to this circular economy, and I think I like actually ideally we'd like to be at the performance economy. I think, but this is, you know, there's, there's a real paradigm shift, so might be, take time, might be difficult. You see, because the product ownership, you know, switches, changes, the waste ownership also, you know, basically it's also changes. So the manufacturer takes responsibility, you know, for, you know in the performance economy. So we are, by no means, we are not there, but I think we, 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 ought, to, we ought to do it. And, and maybe in this sustainability as business approach, you know, this, this, those, those concerns have to be, have to be incorporated. So, so, so I think time is to, to apply ourselves seriously to the um, just, just sort of dealing with the the end of the product life cycle dealing, dealing with waste and, and restoring, restoring the environment because this, this cannot continue. So, you know, and again, those are examples of you know, models that years ago we haven't thought that this is possible, right? I mean, businesses like Uber, you know, basic Facebook or Alibaba in, in China, well, they've become so large businesses and Basically, for example, they don't own any assets, you know, so, so this, is, this is maybe one, one, one reason to, 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 to be positive that, that we can also, you know, smart manufacturing essentially will be, will be resilient, but also will be sustainable. So, uh, and, the, and again, we look at uh, Facebook, Wikipedia, so it's just, just about the same. Basically, the innovation that has taken place was due to basically us, customers, Designing, designing those products. So while, you know, those business models were relatively easy to, to be deployed because of the, the, the specific of the application, while manufacturing is, is obviously more complex, it's, it falls into different category, but I still think that, you know, model of this nature or, or models that we haven't thought about, they can be just applied and develop and deal with uh, sustainability. So the same also, you know, in a way sustainability also applies to the way we innovate because, you know, you can think that innovation is, is actually most wasteful process of perhaps many processes. Because, you know, when we innovate, so the likelihood of coming up with innovation, not invention, just innovation, 
So, so innovation, the difference between inno invention and innovation will be that, well, invention has been sort of accepted by the market. So market says, well, I don't need it, but I'm going to buy it. Okay, so uh, while invention is just a good idea, it could, could be a patent or, or, or you know, our idea in a, in a paper. And unfortunately, very few of those ideas get deployed. So, so, so we also we, we, we generate essentially, you may say, a lot of waste. And I think so maybe we, we, one, one way to think is also that somehow we have or we could also improve you know, the processes leading to more uh, useful, more applicable, and more high impact uh, sort of products of, of research and, and development activity. So how this would look like, for example, I mean, again, I could probably develop here a very high level framework how it could be done, you know, that's, you know, when we formulate problems, you know, that we do our research problems, so then we look not only at data, but also maybe we talk to experts, we talk to users, we talk to developers, and collectively, as a team, develop, develop, a, develop a problem, really. We formulate a problem, and that problem then you know, later is going to be solved. So, so, we, so, so in a way, we, 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 to some degree, we have to follow the framework of, of, of innovation that, you know, in, in the best scenario, use many customers, as many customers as, as we can, to, to design our, our, our problem that we could, we, could, we could solve. Now, so I think in the future, we probably it's fairly fair to say that manufacturing will be more democratic. And actually, this democratization will come from digitization, because as manufacturing becomes digital, and also cloud. Because now, you'll have small company and large company getting the same visibility in the cloud. So if you, you have so, so then, then there's, a, there's a plain, you know, basically field now of competition. Right now, you know, you may have outstanding small business and no one sees it. No one wants to deal with it because, you know, the company even doesn't know to, so everyone ignores that business. I think once business gets presence in the cyberspace, and it's, it will be presented in, in, in an equal way. You know, we'll have used some methodology that will be consistent, or you know, modeling that the methodology will be consistent across different companies. I think that's, 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 this, this, will, this will lead to basically greater equity, equality of uh, companies competing. So now let's, let, let's take it back a little bit on the, the history of, of, of sort of uh, smart manufacturing. So as you know that we, you know, this is like 30 some years ago, so we started with flexible manufacturing, then we, we saw that flexible was in, not flexible, they were just cells, so we need to create computer integrated manufacturing. And we have we established all these different programs, holonic, you know, bionic, intelligent, eventually today we, we, we use the term smart manufacturing or or industry 4.0, or, or, or made in China 2025, yeah? or factory of the future, I think. So each, many companies have own acronyms, but, but in essence, you know, all of those, they lead that, you know, we would like to make auto manufacturing more autonomous, more, basically more smart, and, and you know, so probably in the US, the, the term smart manufacturing was coined, we, we use it quite much, in some countries like Singapore, they also like it. Or in China, they like in the intelligent manufacturing. You know, then, then obviously in many European countries also, yeah, industry 4.0. So, so it doesn't matter actually what label we use, but I think the, the intent is the same. So actually, this intent was actually the same, you know, because in 1990, when I, when I launched Journal of Intelligent Manufacturing, I don't like to like to talk about myself, but this fits here. So. Uh, you know, I launched the journal and wrote a book. Actually, the vision was the same. The only thing, because some people ask me, so what's the difference between intelligent manufacturing and smart manufacturing? Actually, there isn't any. It's only technology has changed. See, probably we did not have machine learning algorithms, like this was a weak point. We had vision systems. We have, we have you know, tactile sensors, so we have plenty of AI, but, you know, was not as, as, as good quality. Or voice recognition system, we have at that time, we, 
but you know, now you can actually use it. At that time, you could say yes or no. So, so, so in essence, this, is, this, is, this hasn't changed. So uh, we, 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 we actually, you know, pursue this journal. We went too far. So now if, if I uh, look at maybe characteristics of, of, of smart manufacturing. So what are going to see? I think that, and, and you can see this by, you know, just in reading various papers. Obviously, condition monitoring is one of the areas where, you know, we see probably a lot of progress. And then, you know, basically perhaps even self, go as far as maybe self-repair in some areas. Uh, and, you know, and the manufacturing has to be able to uh, adapt now to wide, much wider range of production. So batch size of one versus maybe batch size of million or millions. You know, we, we've had this before we, because we dealt with variability in manufacturing. The issue is here that we basically, this is, this is large, much larger spread as well as, as obviously reduction in, 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 in ramp times and SLM change over time, which has been with us for, for, for a long time. <clears throat> now, I see that also there could be, there'll be structural changes in manufacturing. So one of those is that you know that some manufacturing will be, some models of manufacturing that emerge will have fairly you know, we'll have this physical layer and, and cyber layer, and they will be weakly connected. So, um, so, so basically, the, the manufacturing facility will communicate with the, with the, with the cyber, cyber layer. And, and you know, if you, so if there will be a large scale project that may require doubling your or tripling your capacity in three months in a classical model, sort of, you know, capacity expansion, you could not do it because, you know, there is no company that can, you know, grow its size in a traditional way by buying, you know, three times more machines and installing them, having them just running in three months or six months. So, so basically, this will be basically, you know, we'll be sharing manufacturing resources, probably also among com competitors, not, not just companies that we are friendly with, and, and this will happen through the, the, the cyber aspect of it. So, so therefore, we, we need to have this, this, you know, be prepared for such design where, you know, there's separation basically of the physical assets and, and the logistics asset. Well, the second model that emerged is that, well, some companies become actually even more selfish because there will be companies that may develop own material, own product and own process. Well, I'm not going to share this with anyone. I think they will be probably very tightly controlled. So this is like, you know, there will be the best recipe probably for success for them to, 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 to keep everything for themselves. And I'm pretty sure there will be many models in between. So uh, we haven't seen all of this happening. So those are just hypotheses, but, that, but probably there's likelihood that, you know, such models actually will, will, will emerge. So I need to check my my clock here and then uh, basically decide what, what to not talk to about because I think I prepared myself for a little bit longer, longer time period. So, uh, so if, you, if you think like maybe from basically a perspective around, you know, uh, sort of North America, so I see that, you know, a lot of research efforts now goes into new materials as well as, and, and in particular, biomaterials as well as, as, as additional integration, because, you know, we have we are some industries that, you know, like maybe even pharmaceutical industries that you may manufacture powder in one area and then maybe medication in another factory. So I think they will be, will be, will be seeing more integration. And then basically, I think this century may belong to bio. So petrol will be replaced with bio. And I think there's plenty of, 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 of sort of examples of different projects that, that we are coming with, with next generation materials, which are non-traditional materials, like maybe Fran Hofer is, 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 is working here also, IKEA, you know, have made those commitments to not use traditional materials, as well as, you know, maybe plastics, you know, from, from agave. So, so it's amazing that, you know, that you can take 
plant and, and convert them into very usable, very usable materials. So that's, that's a great hope for doing it. Uh, also, the product market will change as well. So, so basically, we, we see now that more flexible, more wearable devices uh, are emerging. So that's, that's also manufacturing will follow the path. As well as, you know, the energy issue is not solved. Because again, for, for, for a number of reasons, you know, for, for this basically to, for, for environment to remain sustainable, so it's, we cannot, ac you know, it's not acceptable that, that most of energy in the world is still generated from fossil fuels. Well, this has to change. And, and so, so there's, there's, there's this, no, there's no perfect solution. So we have, at this point of time, we use wind energy as most viable alternative to fossil fuels. Uh, solar is, 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 is number two, and there's two types of solar. And basically, well, we are switching to natural gas, but this is, you know, people don't realize that natural gas is, 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 is actually also kind of lesser nightmare maybe than oil or coal, but still has carbon content. So when you, burn, when you burn natural gas, you still generate CO2. There's only two industrial gases that do not contain CO2, so that's hydrogen and ammonia. So if you can, if you can produce ammonia and hydrogen, and obviously this is feasible, so that you can, you can, you can really produce environmentally friendly fuels that do not contain any, any carbon. Even, you know, my state, you know, we have, um, we, we produce a lot of biofuels, you know, from corn. But again, those biofuels, including ethanol, they have carbon. They are not as, as harmful to the environment, you know, as, as, as the other fossil fuels, but they still, still contain carbon. So, so we have to, and, uh, you know, and so, so we have to also, in long run, probably replace them as well. And I think healthcare is, is also undergoing this transformation. So, you know, in many cases, factories will be moving actually to hospitals. It's not that this hasn't happened, because, you know, if you go to a respectful hospital, so you'll find that they have a floor where they do plenty of processing, usual tissue. But I think that, you know, some of the automation technology, some of the, you know, probably 3D printing technology, Will, will, will also, will also enter, enter, enter hospitals. So um, now I'd like to see, uh, talk, talk, talk a little bit about the commonality among various processes. Because, and this is because of, of the data perspective. So what happens is that, you know, that, that many of us would like to initiate research in data science, in manufacturing, and we have obstacles of in, in, in terms of data. So data is not that easily sort of accessible. Uh, first of all, availability in some cases is questionable, you know, because we haven't been in this mode, you know, we haven't made, so we haven't selected the right parameters, we have not installed the right sensors in, in machinery to collect data. So if in the absence of such data, we need to look for data elsewhere. And, and, and I'd like to suggest that based on my own experience that, you know, there are many, many processes that sort of are alike. So it's machining process, maybe process in refinery or wind farm. Actually, if you, from the data perspective, from the modeling perspective, they behave in similar ways. So once methodology is developed for studying maybe wind turbines, you know, it can be deployed in hospitals or, or, or in manufacturing. Uh, so for like maybe condition monitoring, you know, so, so there is probably manufacturing is far behind in, in making data available for, for condition monitoring. It's, it's, you know, well, it will be difficult to find a machine tool that will have maybe, say, 40 sec sensors installed. So I've seen, I see that like the latest manufacturing technology that includes maybe traditional machining combines with 3D printing and there's just a handful of sensors because manufacturing didn't know what sensors to install. And this, is, and this is 2018. So if I go to wind turbine that was produced even 15 years ago, that wind turbine will have 120 sensors and, and, you know, and basically streaming data every, well, 
sampling frequency could be nanoseconds, you know, but you can, you can collect data, second day, one second data, you know, 10 second data, and so on. So, so, so then, you know, someone who, you know, would like to do research in machine tools would probably can is, 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 would be advised to go to, to visit maybe wind turbines and get data. And by the way, the data that is, will be collected by wind turbine will be, you know, in a coming in appropriate form. This will be scalar type data. So this is like more or less, you know, transactional data rather than maybe relational data. Because, you know, many industries use Oracle database systems. So they use relational databases and store data. Then in order to get data, you have, you, you spend a lot of time because, you know, the, the, because to, in order to transform them into, into transactional data. So, so this leveraging experience may actually come and, and be, as, as we move from, 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 from different, different domains, because actually what's uh, nice about data science is that you can apply the same methodology, you can apply the same algorithms to, to different processes. And, and in fact, fuse them, you know, so, so that's what also the future is, is going to be, that we'll be taking, you know, biology, technology, and, and basically fusing them into, into, the, into the same model. So, the example of data that could be collected could be, you know, just usually on, on, on equipment is, is sensor data, error data, and for a warranty data. And so, so that's, that's all stored. And, and we, 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 it's up to us to basically analyze such data and use them. So, um, probably I'll skip, I'll skip this because we, ha we don't have much time, but I think maybe talk about this small thing. So, um, let's now, so I have worked with intelligent manufacturing system program that was established in 1995 by Japan and continued for about 10 years. And so I have seen basically uh, successes as well as shortfalls of sort of large scale programs. So I managed you know, one of the sub programs within the intelligent manufacturing system program uh, for about five years. And you know, so I think the industry had very good intentions. Actually, they wanted to transform manufacturing. But I think one element that was missing was trust. So there were multiple companies, predominantly from Japan, but some from the US, some from other Asian countries, as well as Europe. And, you know, and this large group of companies wanted to, to transform, basically, industry. Essentially, their goals were no different. If you look at Industry 4.0 today, or, or any other, other sort of label, then the goal was essentially the same. And actually, the program, well, had some successes, but, you know, did not continue forever, just only for 10 years. So, so I think that in order to, to, to succeed, so I would say today, we need to establish networks of different types of networks. The first network has to do with problem formulation. Because, you know, industry think that they know problems, and, you know, probably some of us also we think that we know industrial problems. But actually, none of that could be completely true. So, you know, a greater thought and, and collaborative effort is required in, in basically formulation of problems, making them valid. Because, you know, I could give lectures here on, 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 on projects that were actually, if, if someone presented to me at day one, I would say, don't continue, because you do more damage than good. Because the project problems were ill, basically formulated. They were so local. And if you solve a local problem, you, it may have global implications that are sort of not favorable. So, so, so I would suggest that, you know, that we, we look, we use consortia, large group of consortia to, to really to formulate problems. And I know this is done, but you know, the question is quality, how it's done and what scale. So, so, so probably, you know, I'm, I'm, I know I'm because everywhere in my own country, I see it, you know, everywhere else, in other countries, there are, there are groups, you know, they, 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 they work, but you know, sometimes you know, there's actually pretending. You know, there's a group on paper, 
but in practice, you know, it's, it does not relate here. So we have to have it. We have to have also, you know, uh, platforms where, we, you know, and this is, this is trickier because IP comes here, that we will be also developing collaboratively solutions. Because, you know, because the problems are, are complex, and I think sometimes, you know, again, one-sided experience is not enough. So we ought to form actually also, also research groups to, uh, to, 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 to develop new, new, new solutions as well as, 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 as models. You know? So that's, again, I view this as a, some kind of a collaborative activity. And I realize because of, of IP issues, this is, this is not, not the easiest. So obviously, in all of this, like, you know, in, 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 whenever new technology emerges, so public government support is, is, is crucial. Now, let me only touch in the last fractions of a second here on, 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 on solutions. So, so obviously, you know, that we, 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 have, we, we make progress in, in mostly machine learning, so we develop new New, new learning algorithms so that, you know, for the first time, models are built for us. You know, I don't have to sit, you know, with a computer or, or pencil and paper and, and, and basically, you know, develop model. Model is built for us. And we need, obviously, just better <laughs> algorithms. And because of the size of the data is increasing, so we need, we need efficient algorithms. So one of the reasons of using extreme learning machines or algorithms, those are basically neural networks, uh, is that they have the property they can learn faster than, than maybe traditional neural network algorithms. Also, model complexity, nonlinearity has increases. So because of that, we, we, use, we use also deep learning algorithms. So, so we are not you know, just coming up with, with, with new names. I think this is everything is needs driven. You know, there is this problem out there with, with large data, and, and then we, 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 we respond appropriately with, with algorithms that are able to handle complex problems as well as be, be faster. Now, so once you develop basically model, then, then we you lose, you look into evolutionary computation. So, so this, 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 this area that sort of develops in parallel has come up with you know, a, a large number of different algorithms, and, and basically we are, we are applying those algorithms to, to solve the problem. So I think in summary, it looks, well, the future is in data, I think, and so, so, so we'll, we'll see more, more data-driven solutions, we'll see more digitization, and I think, and, and especially that, you know, prediction technology is going to play that important role then, uh, you know, the, 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 there, will be, there will be plenty of research opportunities, and, and I think the collaborative mode will, will, will prevail. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kuziak, for your speech. As I said, we have some constraints in terms of time, so we have now time for one question. And then, of course, you will have time during coffee break and lunch to discuss with Professor Kuziak. Joden says one question now, later, one question. So who is brave <laughs> this morning? I'll be the brave one today. Yeah. Okay, good. So, uh, I think one of the important uh, points you touched upon was, uh, you know, this whole notion of uh, the problem coming from the data rather than a problem coming from our mind, and then we look for the data. It's a completely reverse sort of process. And I think it's something that uh, people in computer science and so on, they have that sort of mentality. Um, you know, hard to say, but uh, uh, whereas, you know, in manufacturing traditionally, we, we go the, in, or OR and so on, we go in the reverse uh, direction. So just as a quick comment, uh, uh -huh. you know, I'm working with a pharmaceutical logistics company uh, through a student who is both an employee and is doing research with me at the university. And uh, uh, it's, it's funny because when we interact with the company, you know, we uh, go with these data kind of people. Right. And they're always saying, you know, let's uh, see what kind of problems the data supports rather than, you know, what is the problem you want to solve? Right. So it is a complete change in uh, orientation for us. 
Right. So maybe you can, uh, ex you know, elaborate right. a little right. bit on this uh, issue. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. So, so it's not that you know that entire problem space will be taken over overnight by data-driven modeling. You know, this will be a gradual process. But I think they can have maybe the greatest impact if you make use of the data that you have collected. You know, because the data collection come at cost. So, so, so ideally, we'd like to, to just use this data. So, you know, if, if you have data, so usually something good will come out of it. Now, but you know, but still, you know, we are not taking human out of the loop. So, if, I mean, the, the problem, sort of, the intent, you know, so the initial formulation obviously come, comes from person. It wouldn't have to be necessary, because if I had more data, enough data, then probably, you know, I could overwhelm, you know, even users. But, but, you know, but you can still, so human is still in the loop. Human sort of says, well, this, this, this is the issue we have, but now we like to basically sort of develop a model. And then, you know, so you could develop your, your own model, you know, whatever, just analytical model that you feel comfortable with, and someone else could develop, you know, uh, your, your basic data-driven model, and then you can also compete. You, you, you compare, and you will see that you, the data-driven model, you know, provided there is data support, it will be more comprehensive, and, and, and definitely in most of cases I see, I've never seen a case that would be of less interest, it's usually of more interest, but you know, but this is again, it's, uh, it's, there, has to be, there has to be right data support. So, you know, so I would even go further, I tell you, that I, can, I could rewrite all textbook as, as, as data science textbook, because if you provide me just data, so there is no model that I could not derive. And, and, and basically, I could combine this model because I would say here's, here's chemistry, here's biology, and maybe here's operations, you know, and you have, you, have, you, have those, you have data in those areas, you know, then actually I can combine them, I come, come with one, one, one complex model. And that is not doable in, you know, with, with classical science. So, so I'm not... We are not throwing it away, you know. Sometimes we develop also classical science, you know, because it's, it's, good, it's good in certain areas. But when it comes to actually deploying, you know, developing models that you'd like to deploy in, in applications, then I would argue that most of them will be data-driven. Sometimes we develop hybrid models, but we don't see advantage. You know, in some cases we have, you know, imagine a model that you have also, there is some, uh, experimental, you know, parameter. They say, oh, so, we, you know, sometimes this experimental parameter is actually, is a very complex function. So, so we model this complex function, you know, into in high fidelity and, and, class, and combine classical model with the, with the data-driven model. But again, it's not better than I just develop data model from scratch. Okay, so. Okay, I guess uh, uh, we had uh, a, a brief discussion, but anyway, interesting. So again, thank you, Professor Kuziak. And on, on behalf of the entire organizing committee, we would like to give you a present uh, as a memory of, uh, of Incon Conference. Oh, I like presents. <laughs>